As we learn, we actually change the structure of the brain. All parts of the brain are connected by these bundles of nerve fibers, crisscrossing the interior like telephone lines. Each time we repeat an action or a word, the connection we're using becomes stronger. So as we achieve new knowledge and skills, we literally rewire our brains. These reconnections make humans remarkably flexible in what we can learn. It's one reason for our success as a species. The rewiring takes place within the front brain. It's the part of our brain that thinks. The front brain has reached its maximum complexity in humans after billions of years of evolution. The brain of our earliest ancestors, the fish, has only a very small front region, the fringe on the left. The main bulge deals with sight, the fish's most important sense. The front brain grew rapidly as our ancestors became amphibians. By the time reptiles evolved, it was the largest part of the brain. In a bird, the front brain has enlarged further. A bird is smarter than a reptile. In the first mammals, the growth of the front brain and intelligence continued, until in humans, the crinkled surface of the front brain seems to have taken over entirely. But hidden inside and below, we still have our ancient fishy brain carrying out its age-old functions. These nether regions of the brain keep our hearts beating and our lungs breathing. The cauliflower-shaped cerebellum keeps our bodies in balance. The human cerebellum is the most complex in the animal kingdom, possibly because it's more difficult to balance on two legs than on four. This early part of the brain has a primitive beauty all its own. Without the cerebellum, we'd have to concentrate on standing upright and taking every step. From its primitive base upwards, the human brain has successive layers of intricate connections and staggering complexity. In these layers is hidden everything that makes us individuals. Emotions, memories, aspirations, and thoughts. The human brain has reached its present complexity and size in only five million years since the human lineage split from the chimpanzee. The story of the brain's evolution is revealed by changes in the skull. A modern chimpanzee has a brain only slightly smaller than one of our possible ancestors, Australopithecus africanus, who lived three million years ago. Two million years ago, a larger-brained early human emerged. These people made the first tools. Dating back half a million years, this human skull housed a brain twice as large as the early Australopithecus. Homo erectus had mastered the art of using fire. The human brain reached its present size 130,000 years ago but it took another 100,000 years to reach a mental capacity similar to ours. A child from 35,000 years ago could easily learn all the skills needed to survive in present-day society. The human characteristics that evolved then, self-expression and curiosity, are still the cornerstones of society today. 
I'm going to keep cruising around here for you. This is the number of nerve cells in the brain has multiplied immensely over the past few million years. The brain was in danger of outgrowing the skull, but it was saved by a clever piece of geometry. The cells we use to think lie on the surface of the brain, in a layer just one-eighth of an inch thick, the cortex. And a large surface can be stuffed into a small volume by crumpling it up. Like a sheet of paper, the cortex has crumpled into fissures and grooves. If we smoothed out the crinkles, the cortex would be the size of a pillowcase. With these intricate folds, we far outdistance the thinking power of even the largest animal brain. The nerve cells in the cortex do everything that's unique to humans. To make decisions, to voice opinions, to interpret what we see and hear, and to understand it. The crumpled cortex forms two distinct hemispheres, each filled with bundles of nerves. The two halves have different ways of interpreting the world. The left hemisphere thinks in words, while the right half thinks in images and feelings. The nerves exchange information through a dense band at the base of the brain. Every point in the right hemisphere is connected to an exact mirror image point in the left hemisphere. If the word water appears here in the left hemisphere, then just here the right hemisphere has an image of water. To prevent any argument within the brain, one hemisphere, almost always the left, makes the ultimate decisions. When it comes to controlling the muscles, each hemisphere is responsible for one side of the body, all the way from the feet and legs to the hands and eyes. But the lines of command cross over. The left side of the body is connected to the brain's right hemisphere. While sensations from the right side of your body end up in the left hemisphere. The most sensitive regions command a disproportionate number of nerve cells in the brain's feeling center, called the sensory cortex. This weird figure shows how your brain feels your body to be. Highly sensitive parts loom large in the brain's view of the body. The lips look huge because they're extremely sensitive and ideal for displaying our feelings. Children instinctively use their lips to explore the world around them. The ball stimulates the nerves in his lips sending signals to this very specific part of the brain. A different part of the sensory cortex lights up when you touch something with your right index finger. The hand is packed with nerve endings, so we feel it to be much larger than life. The thumb is biggest of all. It can discriminate the finest details by touch. The entire back stimulates fewer nerve cells in the sensory cortex than the palm of your hand. A second figure shows how much of the brain is devoted to controlling our bodies. His largest parts have many nerve cells in charge of finely tuned muscles. The two distorted figures have much in common. Parts of the body sensitive to touch generally need the finest control. From birth, our nerves can feel sensations, but it takes time and patience to control our muscles properly. <laughs> 